took the opportunity in this session this morning that we will um, introduce you to different aspects of one of the same problem uh, project we are working on. And one of the big advantages we have in Rocky is that we can actually deal with large-scale geographical patterns simply um, because um, we have the Rocky database and um, that means um, we can include um, a large number of data points which, is, uh, which makes it a lot easier uh, to apply some statistical models to validate your data sets. Yeah. Um, I'm not telling you something new, many of you are archaeologists but um, sometimes this is a real problem, as uh, Michael already indicated just in his talk. Yeah? If you cut out too many sites, if you leave them away. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't do a more specific analysis of a single locality with the um, um, land use patterns which are included, which are um, preserved in this particular assemblage. Um, actually, um, I feel quite well being squeezed in between uh, Michael's presentation, who was uh, dealing with um, the way we evaluate data sets, primary evaluation, if you want so, and Ericsson's talk, who will introduce you um, an agent based model, which we started uh, to assemble, uh, how, how should I design, <laughs> to work with uh, data we are, uh, or to analyze, to further analyze uh, the data sets. My talk now will be rather conceptual. So I will talk about concepts, I will talk about definitions, and I will talk about modeling and simulation in a general sense. Um, the ex concept of expansions, this is uh, our primary working tool in the Rocky project. Um, I started, although I started my talk with um, geographic expansions and geographic patterns which we may analyze, you should keep in mind that this is only, ooh, sorry, take a finger. This is only one aspect yeah, um, of our expansion concept. What we have um, actually to link and what we are trying to link in the Rocky project are range expansions, that means geographical patterns, with expansions, with ecological expansions, namely the e uh, expansions of the hominin resource base and the expansions in hominin performances. Yeah, um, and these are um, what we just had in the discussion. This is the cultural differences, yeah, and the differences in how um, specific a specific resource spectrum is exploited and used. Yeah, um, these three different types of expansions are not independent from each other. Um, but um, interrelated and in order to study this um, we are using um, uh, a system of uh, the concept of supply systems which can be described for many different aspects in the life of early hominins. Food acquisition and procurement is only one aspect of that. Yeah? It's one supply system but of course it's the one which is studied and understood best simply because it leaves a lot of physical traces both uh, with respect to artifacts um, but also with respect um, to the analysis we can do on bones and teeth. Yeah. Um, within such a supply system, for instance for food, um, a relation is uh, established between the hominins and their environment, which consists of resources. And there are a number of factors which have an impact on this um, relationship. For instance, the knowledge of the, the hominids have about their environment, about the dynamics which occur, 
the practices which they use, but also uh, involving technology. <coughs> and here, this is a, an older version. I have to apologize for that, but I didn't find last night a newer version <laughs> of our supply systems. Institutions, of course, refers to the uh, modern societies. Yeah? We would probably, in the case of a Neanderthal, uh, rather speak of um, uh, common agreements, for instance, of how food should be distributed uh, among group members. Um, as I already said, um, food, so, uh, food supply, so, uh, the system of food supply uh, plays a major role when we are dealing with uh, hominins simply because we have a large, data, a large database to discuss. Um, for instance, just to give you an example, um, to, uh, to show you how we analyze this, I have to apologize, this is an, um, a Homo erectus versus earlier hominids examples. Um, but this shows you how a similar type of environment is exploited in different ways depending on the practices and the technology you have at your disposal. In one case, um, if you are using tools and if um, you are using fire, you have a higher number and a higher uh, diversity of resources you can actually manage than in the other case. Uh, then if you um, are lacking these technologies and if you do not know if they are not involved in practices. <coughs> this is, seems to be very trivial. <coughs> but we can examine um, such food baskets or baskets of goods if you want to put it in a more general sense and we can examine um, their composition and, and conclude how an environment is actually used by different types of hominids. And the question with respect to MIS-6, MIS-5e would be, if I change the environment, what practices and uh, which parts of the food basket did actually not change? Yeah? And how did they accomplish? Yeah? This would be, uh, this is a question which we try to study at the moment in our MIS-5e study. So we are looking at baskets of goods which uh, play a role, which represent the number of resources which are used um, within a supply system. Just to give you another example, um, we can examine, and that's uh, what I'm studying, that's what I'm doing together with my colleague Angela Bruch, um, the composition of the environment, the climate, but also the plants and animals which are uh, principally available for exploitation. Um, <coughs> how the dynamics of the system depends on the seasonal availability of some of these resources, but also general environmental dynamics like the difference between a glacial and an interglacial. Yeah. Of course, the uh, resource spectrum which is available differs a lot. <coughs> um, on the other hand, um, we can study our hominids themselves. Um, they are, uh, the archaeology, the tools they use, their behavior, but also um, if we examine, for instance, um, uh, in the case of nutrition, if we uh, do, if we perform um, uh, isotope studies on teeth or morphological studies on teeth, we can conclude on the composition of the spectrum of food resources they actually exploit. That means we can use uh, both um, parts um, to um, uh, uh, infer from the available resources which part of the resource spectrum has actually been exploited and used. Yeah? Um, this is our basket. 
and we can identify how this basket uh, was composed and what kind of resources it, was act it actually contained. Now, um, <coughs> such supply systems, food is only one example, but we can think about other kinds of um, supply systems. For instance, for clothing, yeah, um, and um, also for housing, yeah, which have a spatial relation and which allow us to constitute a specific uh, relationship between the hominins and their environments. Um, these are the concepts we apply to interpret a particular situation. I'm not going through that now in particular detail um, we, um, as uh, uh, Michael did uh, when he introduced a, a specific part of the, of the spatial behavior of Neanderthals in MIS 5e and MIS 6 where he didn't find a lot of differences. That does not necessarily mean that all the components of all the supply systems um, are similar in both cases just that we did not find differences in, the, in these particular um, studies. Now, if we turn this into an agent-based model, this is a representation, and I'm uh, continuing now um, some discussions we had um, in the, during the last couple of days. If we want to turn this into an agent-based model, this is what many people think happens. I have a lot of data, I create an agent-based model, I threw the data into my model and out comes the answer to all of my questions. This is not working. Yeah? If we want uh, to... Uh, um, an an agent-based model is an extremely powerful tool um, but we shouldn't be surprised, it only can work on the things I already know. This is not only data. This is in particular um, um, the relations between the different parts of the model. So, instead of um, throwing data into our agent-based model, we are actually doing something else. And the presentation of Michael was a very good example for that. Because what he did was actually he evaluated, he used some, some statistical models to evaluate a primary data set. And it's not the primary data which goes into the model, it's actually, it's actually model data. This mo these models may uh, reflect uh, features of the environment or they may reflect features of the agent but uh, this is not primary data it's data which is already modeled and there are all also more complex ways of modeling that but statistics is only a statistical evaluation is one way of doing that so and this data goes into our agent based model um, an important thing is when we start to design such a model, we should make sure that we actually be, know what our model is, is doing with our data, of how the uh, data is processed and what our model can do and cannot do. So before we start using it to carry out experiments, we should definitely make sure that we carry out sensitivity studies and that we do and that we perform internal validation of the model because otherwise we do not really know what our model is doing. We cannot. And out of the model comes data which has to be evaluated again by modeling um, uh, by um, using different ways of modeling. They also can be simple and they can show just monitoring, uh, ways to monitor. But on the other hand, uh, we can also use and apply more complex forms of modeling. Should I? Sp <laughs> <laughs> 
Maybe I should use the mic as long. Okay. Um, and just to distinguish these both parts, because this hasn't been done very carefully during the last couple of days in the discussions, at least I participated, I would call, um, I would like to propose to call the modeling parts, which happen before and after uh, the agent based model, I would call this modeling. And I would reserve the term simulation for what happens when we experiment um, in, a, uh, in the frame of an agent-based model. Yeah? Just to distinguish between both ways of quantifying and working with, with data and with models. Okay, um, an important aspect which uh, has been touched a number of times in this talk is the question what is the level of our study and this is also something really really important which we have to keep in mind when we study um, when we start to design um, agent ba an agent based model um, Michael's uh, model he just introduced was designed to study spatial patterning of course, there can be um, ways to study data on a very local way and um, the fact that he decided to do a continent-wide study does not mean that uh, we cannot evaluate the data on another level. The question is, how are these levels related to each other? Yeah? Is the lower level, can the higher level simply be by upscaling steps? I don't think so. And we have a number of um, uh, evaluation methods which are related to different levels of analysis, both in space, as I showed here, and as I'm showing here, and also um, with respect to time. We, can, we have to distinguish between a number of cases and we have to, ch to choose our agents appropriately. For instance, if we carry out a local study asking for shifts uh, between a uh, different season, for uh, changes, for behavioral changes in different seasons, we will probably look at individuals or a single group on the other hand, if we look on continent-wide patterns, it definitely doesn't make a sense to uh, focus on, uh, on the behavior of individuals or a single group. Instead, we would compare different localities. And that might also mean that we may study um, uh, a variety of household groups. Now, we can combine a number of different levels um, what doesn't make sense is actually to study um, uh, with respect to spatial resolution local groups or local individuals on a very long time scale. Yeah? Um, or, it, uh, for instance, um, to study uh, very short cycles on a continent-wide scale. I want to put this as an open question for discussion, but I feel that would be um, a scale mismatch and we should actually um, make sure that we can generalize this way. Now, if we level our food baskets, um, the study uh, which, I, uh, which we are intending is focusing on a local scale <laughs> on a local scale and um, it will probably focus on a few households. Yeah. Um, we will also study glacial interglacial dynamics, but we start on the local uh, scale to evaluate single groups. You will see that um, in the model which Ericsson is introducing in a minute. However, 
um, we can find many examples where we um, start where we um, study um, cases in which I would actually um, think or would like to raise the question whether there isn't a mismatch in, in the scales or whether this works. Yeah? And another example which is uh, quite exciting um, because we can do it in Rocky is to, to really take um, the large, a large focus, a large uh, range and a large, uh, on, a, on a large time scale into focus in which we can study simply because we have created tools to collect the data which is necessary for that. So before I'm handing over um, to Ericsson who will introduce the agent-based model which we, um, are, we are working on at present, I have set up a wish list for agent-based modeling, uh, which you might wish to consider. The first thing is, um, please clarify your terms and concepts. If we talk about, um, uh, as uh, Michael did when he introduced the methods he applied, he explained what do I mean, what kind of specialization index uh, am I using here, um, how is it defined um, in a mathematical way and how do I want to use it if I, infer, if I base inferences on the evaluation of my data sets. The second uh, point to consider is probably please state your aims. What do you really want to know from your agent-based model if you are designing that? Yeah. It's my last slide anyway. So. <laughs> Organize the levels of your study yeah? and think about um, on which level do I need to design um, an agent-based model and how is this level related to um, other levels. Um, then choose your appropriate models. Um, an agent-based model uh, is an extremely powerful instru instrument because you can carry out experiments with that, but it cannot answer all the questions. Yeah? There are some um, questions uh, which you uh, should focus on, which you, um, for which you simply need another way of modeling. And finally, know your agent-based model when you start to design it. You should never underestimate the power of your imagination. Yeah? And you see data doing things which it actually doesn't do at all. So, and uh, with this, uh, my uh, agent-based modeling wish list, I'm open for some short questions, but then I'm handing over to Ericsson to introduce our ABM.